The simple tent stake, blacksmithing pure and basic. You hammer a point on one end, and then you bend a hook on the other end. What could be easier? And really, they are quite simple to make. The problem is nobody wants just one. They want a dozen or two dozen or more tent stakes. And over the years, I have made tens of thousands of tent stakes. Really, it all started back when I was doing the Mountain Man Rendezvous and we were taking ironware to sell. And part of what I took were tent stakes, usually 50 or 100 and in assorted sizes. The ones I'm showing you today are half inch square bar and they're cut 16 inches long. One 20 foot bar ends up being 15 tent stakes. So it comes out even, no waste. It's really quite a convenient way to do it. When we were taking these to the rendezvous to sell, it was all retail. There was no wholesale. Then one day somebody approached me and asked about wholesale pricing. They wanted to buy them in quantity. Now the price I had been selling them at was reasonable. I was making money at it. I wasn't losing anything, but I wasn't getting rich at it. So now suddenly somebody wants to buy larger quantities and I need to cut my price. Now cutting my price and making more of them, in other words, working harder to make less money, probably wasn't the best idea. But of course I saw the dollar sign at the bottom of the sales deal and th thought, oh, that's a lot of money. I wasn't thinking that it was also going to be way more work than it was worth for that amount of money. So how big of an order was that? Well, this person wanted 100 dozen at a time. That's a lot of tent stakes. That was over a thousand tent stakes per order, and he was doing this every few months. So we had to get really good, and by we, I mean me and my wife, because she comes and helps in the shop from time to time. We had to get really good at making tent stakes. And that's really what today's video is about, is some of the things we learn that took a pretty bad wholesale price point and turned it into more profit than I'd ever made making tent stakes. And today they are still one of my most profitable items if I could find enough customers that wanted tent stakes. Now the first thing you have to think about when working in large quantities is materials. Where are you gonna get your materials? Have you been scrounging materials and now you're faced with needing a thousand items worth of materials instead of the three or four you can scrounge per week, you're going to have to buy new materials and you're going to have to go to some place that specializes in those materials. Now at the time I was living up in Denver, there are lots of steel suppliers in Denver I could shop around for the best price. Eventually, while we were still working on this commission, is when I moved down here to Beulah and suddenly there were only a couple of dealers I could work with and the price was all about the same. Now these dealers charge for cut charges if I wanted to have the pieces cut in half to put in the back of the pickup. So that means I either had to cut them or I had to have them delivered. One place wanted to charge for delivery. The other place when I was buying that much steel in a single order would deliver for free. That means it saved me about two to three hours driving to town and picking up materials and didn't cost me anything to have it show up at the shop. So immediately, I've just saved two to three hours on every order of tent stakes, and I haven't done anything but place a phone call. The next issue to deal with is turning those bars, roughly 100 bars per order, into usable stock sizes. That's a lot of cutting to do, and a chop saw seems to make a lot of sense. But a chop saw isn't as fast as it seems like by the time you cut that much material. Plus, it goes through blades, and you have to buy blades, and those cost you more money, and that lowers your profit margin. They also use electricity. They're noisy. They're dusty. And they have a certain amount of risk to them if a blade should ever break. So a chop saw wasn't the ideal cutting element for us. Now, I already had this Edwards number no. 5 shear, and I already liked it for cutting up stuff like that. So it was a no-brainer to go ahead and use the shear to cut the materials we needed. And the shear wasn't bad, it was relatively efficient, a lot of work because it's all manual, but not as efficient as I would have liked because I have to come slide the material through the shear, hold it in place, pull the handle, then come back and grab the next bar.
What we found out was that if my wife came and helped and we loaded all the bars up on work stands so they were easy to slide into the shear and set a stool next to the shear, she could sit right here and feed the material into the shear. All I had to do then was just pull the handle and I never left the handle, I never let go of it. Now it seems logical that two people doing the job one person was doing would double your efficiency. Well that simply was not the case. It actually tripled or quadrupled our efficiency. It was so much faster to do it that way, it only took us a couple of hours to cut up over a thousand tent stakes. A huge improvement in the timeline. So we've already saved time and money by having the materials delivered from a company that would deliver for free. We saved more time and money by using the shear instead of the chop saw, and even more time by working together so that there were two people that really magnified our efficiency. So already our profit margin is getting better than when I was just doing them by myself beforehand. Well, now when we were doing this, I already owned the 50 pound little giant power hammer, but it was a little bit too big. It didn't have the fine control and the finesse to forge the points on the tent stakes very accurately. It was really easy to squish them too flat in one dimension or get them way too skinny and kind of bent up. So it wasn't the best. And even though we used it for that purpose, a lot of them had to then go to the anvil and had to be straightened by hand. And that wasn't real efficient. But sometime after the first few orders, we acquired this 25 pound little giant. And we really bought this for my wife to use in the shop because she had her own little corner of the shop with her own forge and her own anvil. We found very quickly that this, because it was lighter, was the perfect tool for doing tent stakes. And with a little bit of ingenuity, we made it even better. And that was not a matter of improving the power hammer, it was a matter of improving our workflow around the power hammer. By bringing a gas forge over close to the power hammer and loading it up, and the gas forge we were using at the time had a door wide enough to get a dozen tent stakes in. You could get a dozen points hot all at the same time. You could sit in a stool and you could sit at the power hammer and you could make tent stakes. And you kept a pile of tent stakes next to the forge and you hammered tent stakes out endlessly and it, somebody could come in and bring you another pile of tent stakes from time to time and it took about three or four hours then to forge all of the tent stake points this way and you put them in a big pile on the floor. Now another tool that came into our shop in about this same time period was the fly press. I didn't buy the fly press just for making tent stakes. In fact, making tent stakes with it had never even occurred to me, just like that is not the reason we bought the 25 pound Little Giant. But this tool was in the shop and it tempted me to see if I could figure out how to make tent stakes with it. So I decided to give it a try. Now at that time I had not built a stand. This was still bolted to the pallet that it was delivered on. I'd had it just a couple of days. The pallet was sitting on a moving dolly, you know, one of these four wheel things that you can slide anywhere in the shop to get it out of your way or to get it over to where you're gonna lift it up and put it on the stand. And fly presses really wanna turn. So on a moving dolly, every time you turn this handle, the fly press wants to spin around in circles, but I thought I'd give it a little try anyways just because I wanted to experiment some with it and try out the new tool. So I made this little set of dies here that are a round pusher and a little saddle that you push the tent stake down into. And this is the same set of dies. This is the set of dies that has made tens of thousands of tent stakes, all mild steel, really worn. It's got a big groove worn in it, still works perfect. And just like setting up to use the little giant, we brought a forge closer to the fly press to allow us to not have to take so many steps between forge and the tool. There is one other step, however, that had to be done right before the fly press, and you did it in the same heat. That is knock the sharp edges off of the end of the, the bar because 
cutting left sharp edges and your other option is grinding. So much easier to just forge the corners of that sharp bar off and then bring it to the fly press. So by putting an anvil that wasn't bolted to the floor between the forge and the fly press, it meant about a half a step to the anvil, forge that end on it, then another half a step over to the fly press to bend the hook, and you could do that all in one heat. So that's a look at both how to forge a very simple item, a tent stake, it's all blacksmithing, it's all forging, there's no welding, there's no plasma cutting, there's no grinding. It's just forge a point and bend a hook on the end and you're done. And of course there are other styles of tent stakes if you want to do something different. I've seen lots of different versions of the tent stake. These are just the ones that I was being asked to make at the time. The main point of this video was really to look at some production-minded approaches to things. How to change your workflow and your approach to things that are simple to start with, but make them more efficient and more profitable if you're trying to make a profit selling your work. Do you need all this big equipment? Do you need a shear, a power hammer, and a fly press to make simple items? Of course you don't. You should be able to do all of this by hand at the anvil. Does owning the shear, the power hammer, and the fly press speed up your work and help you go from that perhaps $10 an hour shop rate to $50 an hour or better? Of course it does. It really can make a difference if that equipment is suited to your work. It certainly doesn't do to have any equipment that doesn't suit the kind of work you're doing, but the big equipment can make a difference and it can make you profitable. Now our tent state commission dried up years ago. The company has gone out of business, have no idea where the guy went. But in the time that we were making tent stakes at a hundred dozen per order, we easily paid for the fly press, we easily paid for the little giant power hammer, covered all the other shop expenses, and put money in our pocket. So the retail price we were selling them at was, eh, money. By the time we were done and had perfected the system, or at least perfected it as far as we got, there's probably ways to make it better, we were making really good money at the wholesale price and the retail price was excellent money. So now retail tent stakes really are one of my most profitable items. I just don't have a hundred people a month coming by to buy two or three dozen tent stakes. So I don't make much money making them. In fact, I rarely make them anymore, but every now and then it's a quick, simple thing to do. Just doing this video, I actually made a half dozen of them and those will be a round if somebody wants them, or I'll end up using them myself because they do come in handy for all sorts of things. I hope you enjoyed that video and found it useful. Give it a thumbs up if you did. As always, I would love it if you'd hit that subscribe button. Stick around, watch a few of the other videos, but make time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but do it safely, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.